Good morning. Good morning, Taya uh, Yahaipi. Welcome to the uh, ESA Tech Section webinar series for November. Uh, we say one yet to we winter moon. And uh, again, I'm James Rowlingleaf. Uh, let me introduce myself again in the Lakota way as we say, Bichante. I did not bet you Zapolo. I greet you with a handshake from my heart. And it's real, uh, real honored for you to be here with us today. And uh, welcome to our webinar again. And, you know, this is Native American Heritage Month. And I'll be serving as your, as your moderator. And uh, we had some big news here this week. We had the uh, White House Tribal Nations Summit. And I'm hoping that we'll get into that today with, with, uh, with our guest speaker. Um, also, as moderator, we've been practicing what we call Wolakota protocols, the idea of principles, protocols, and practice. Uh, we, as you recalled, our first webinar, we had our elder from um, Lakota country give a opening prayer, and she asked in that prayer that when we do these things, we do them in good ways. We respect each other, we listen to each other, and we learn from each other, and we share with each other, and all in a good way. So we're grateful for our, our, our knowledge holders that we still have today. We're grateful for our elders and our, um, our, our traditional leaders who help us uh, with these kind of things that, um, that we do. Uh, please add your name and your organization in the chat. Uh, we uh, we want to make sure that uh, we know who you are and where you're from, and we're all glad that you're here. So we welcome you in a good way. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of um, our, our presenters' uh, session today, and um, also that this will be recorded. So we record these because there's many people who've been watching um, these um, these sessions now over the last uh, eight months, and it's been really a uh, a great resource to them and I'm, I'm always surprised when I hear that people reference these webinars and how um, how important they are but also you know how helpful they are in terms of understanding this idea of traditional ecological knowledge and also we'll have we have we'll have evaluation so if you please um, fill out those evaluations that helps us uh, at ESA again to um, to do a to do a good good job and uh, bring in presenters and help us understand where we're doing well and where we need to improve. So with that, I want to I want to welcome uh, Dr. Valerie Small to to our webinar series. Uh, you saw her what her her bio. Uh, she's a friend, a good friend, and a colleague of mine, and I've known her for many years, and I, I respect her uh, her work a lot. And I got to work with her a little bit at the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center uh, many years ago. Um, through the through these years, she's been involved in many organizations, tribal organizations, advancing uh, science, investing traditional ecological knowledge, and uh, she's just uh, been a, a real leader, uh, been part of the National Climate Assessment work. She's been part of uh, NOAA's um, uh, Northern Plains uh, toolkit process, been, helped her with that. She led that as well. And uh, she's from the Crow Nation. Um, the Crows and Lakotas, you know, we have a, we kind of have a difficult history, <laughs> but, but somehow we stayed friends over the years, Val. And so we're so happy you're here with us. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, Val, and uh, welcome. And thank you again for your time today. Aho, uh, Kashila. Um, thank you. It's, uh, I'm so honored to be here um, and to talk about things that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, traditional knowledge, I believe, um, doesn't just include ecology. I think it includes many of other knowledges as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all of the people that are on here um, and, and having a discussion, hopefully, uh, to the end. Um, so let me see if I can, how do I do this? Get my screen and your screen off and my screen on. So I just go to share and. Yes, you should be able to share it. Okay, there we go. Here it is. So um, again, uh, Currently, I'm affiliate faculty at Colorado State University. I've had some unfortunate accidents this year that have uh, resulted in my taking a step back and trying to figure out where I want to take uh, my passion currently on uh, trying to build local economies um, on reservations and uh, particularly revolving around food sovereignty and, and ag and food sources um, that we have um, that are our traditional sources. So thank you again. And before we get started, I always want to do a land honoring acknowledgement uh, that I am currently on the traditional homelands 
of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. So before I get started into this slide, um, James brought up this great thing that I wanted to see if I would, there was some way I could sort of pause this uh, presentation and go on. But I think many people have seen maybe on LinkedIn um, and also through maybe Facebook that the White House is now trying to incorporate what they call indigenous tribal ecological knowledge um, into policy or within um, many of the departments um, that we have. And we're grateful to have indigenous leadership finally, um, particularly with the Department of Interior. Um, and so it's great to have that representation. Um, I think it's, uh, it's great, but I think what I hope that when I share what I have to share with you today from my research, that you recognize that really land policy, land tenure policy needs to change and they need to be codified. Policies need to be codified um, because administrations will come and go. And so as a result, um, you may not see, even though there's support for this right now in the White House, um, there has to be action behind Action meaning not just words, but um, there has to be action. And, and, and the only way to do that is to run it through Congress and get it codified. And what I'm talking about uh, throughout this is doing just that, is listening to uh, these indigenous voices. Um, and so tribal presence really needs to be um, restored for the land. And that just doesn't apply to indigenous lands uh, that are formally called, that are currently called reservations because frankly, uh, it's all native land. Um, and so these worldviews and wisdom are really vital to humanity, particularly now, given that climate change is finally, I think starting to become at the forefront of many. Um, and, and although we didn't get as much as we wanted with COP20, with our recent um, climate change work, um, at least, we're moving forward, I think, in the right direction. I do think indigenous voices need to continue to be lifted um, uh, more than they are currently. So just um, talking a little bit about indigenous knowledge and Western science for those who are on and just really aren't familiar, um, despite uh, these deep relationships with people in place, they have place-based histories with, within their natural environments and really indigenous people have limited uh, participation, as I talked about earlier, on science and policy, um, and climate change is one example. Um, limited access, power imbalances, differences really in world views, I think, are what have kept us from trying to raise these voices, these important voices. Um, so Western science really focuses on, you know, facts. What can we, you know, uh, primarily put down quantitatively. Uh, and you'll see in my work that I did both quantitative and qualitative, and I'll explain why um, for this particular purpose, and that's because of Western science views. Indigenous views, however, really, we embrace the relationship to our spiritual and biophysical environment, and we indicate important and distinct contributions that each knowledge system can contribute. So an example of time really is that it's Sort of a measurement of clocks and calendars and really traditional knowledge is really time tied to sort of events that um, are related to resource availability um, and what is culturally available to us during these various seasons of the year. Um, problem focused approach really through TEK is really this co-production of knowledge um, whereas holistic decision making um, sort of is the ecology of this where tribal values are sharing decision-making um, and it, it feeds into all of these other issues related to climate, environmental change, um, non-biodiversity threats, threats to biodiversity, rights, human land resources, place-based identity and sacred sites and so on. So traditional knowledge is really, um, I think brings scientists and indigenous people together to sort of collaborate and exchange these knowledges. Rising Voices is one uh, specific group that is very good at trying to do that. Um, it benefits through mutual learning and sort of a mutual generation of knowledge. Um, whereas I think previously, historically, that at least anyway, when I wanted to, to publish my work, 
um, I was uh, told that it, it needed to go through a Native American journal, even though it was an ecology and it, it did include some um, qualitative work uh, rising that voice uh, within the community. Unfortunately, they just said, sorry, it's not important for an ecology paper article, journal article, send it to a Native American journal article. So um, I think things are, have changed significantly since I had to go through um, some very difficult times through my master's and PhD work. Um, and I think others on here probably can say that although some of that may be uh, improving, it, there's still a long way to go. Uh, that benefits through mutual learning, focus on social context, um, really less recognized as implications of these multicultural legal and risk benefit and governance contexts. So traditional knowledge is science versus indigenous is really sort of lived action versus inaction. Uh, we rely on our elders and our oral histories are really important to uh, declaiming who we are. And we really recognize the sacredness of all things that are both animate and inanimate. Indigenous voices really have been previously ignored, particularly in dealing with federal agencies and with academics um, primarily um, who sort of looked at this as sort of folklore, um, not to be believed sort of mythic um, knowledge that they are now starting to come around to recognize that these long histories within these um, ecosystems are key to determining how we move forward in protecting those and regenerating these really degraded ecosystems, particularly on reservations. So there's distinct differences um, that I wanna point out between something that has been recently talked about. Um, I think uh, Fawn Sharp talked about this as well, um, is that there are sig significant differences between consent um, and consultation and always, Previously, it's been federal agencies were required to consult with tribes. Um, and really, instead, it needs to be with consent, informed consent. Um, because oftentimes, it's, it's really at the planning stages that tribes have been left out. Um, and rather, they need to be there in the planning stages and leading that, whether that's ancestral lands that are um, tangential to the lands within reservation boundaries, um, or, uh, or other uh, lands within reservation boundaries that are determined to be trust and uh, individual and tribal trust lands. And I'll get into that in a minute. That sort of really drove my work um, that un unfortunately I feel like really needs to continue to be discussed, particularly relative to um, building circular economies if we're gonna be successful at doing that. Um, food and ag are really key to building circular economies, most of the foods that are purchased um, are purchased off of reservations. Um, we have a lot of species that we could sort of be restoring and bringing back, not just to improve the diets and go back to a more traditional diet, but those can also serve as ways in which uh, people like um, uh, my dear niece, um, uh, Grace Bulltail, or not Grace, sorry, Grace, uh, Cedar Bulltail, um, who is basically utilizing um, these, uh, all of these native species uh, to build sort of a product line, if you will, and also utilize that for food systems uh, within, the, um, within the community. Um, so community engagement is key. Um, and so this was my PhD work that I did back, finished back in 2013, that was conducted on uh, the reservation and I think it's important to talk about where this emanated from. And I've let these be blurred for a purpose. I don't want these to be anything that uh, is giving away something that's uh, very sacred and traditional of our Sundance, our Big Lodge. Um, however, this is kind of what drove the work that I did. So it was really informed by um, my uh, work wanting to identify um, whether our plains cottonwood certain size structures were going to be available to harvest or currently more difficult to find as a result of climate change and also because of an invasive species that is really out competing our traditional um, cottonwoods, which you see here in the center. So historically, let's talk about land right ideology and treaty tribes and 
you know, some of this is going to be old hat for many of you. Um, others, it may be new, but the doctrine of discovery has been this, our Fort Laramie treaties was really where a lot of land cessations happened um, during the Dawes Act, the General Allotment Act, as they call it. My grandfather was allotted land, um, as well as my great grandmother and mother. And so what's happened is they were allotted certain parcels of land um, and, in, and feeling that land wasn't being utilized productively because we were not agrarian uh, per se, but rather uh, utilizing it for, for our horses and also for buffalo, our bison and other wild game, um, being more of a subsistence and hunter gatherer. Um, and, and essentially what happened is they were allowed, the government was allowed to come in and say, okay, here's the allotted land for tribal members. The rest of it's gonna be opened up. Um, and that is resulted in what we call the checkerboard ownership on the Crow Reservation and other reservations, I think, have also um, had this happen to them. And it makes for very difficult land management issues as we'll get into. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs is really the BIA trust agent. Um, some of the issues we had that the 1920 Crow Act was supposed to really kind of uh, fix was, um, and it wasn't until 10 or 15 years later is that a lot of illegal land leasing happens, uh, also uh, illegal sales um, that happened. And so as a result, a lot of the ag um, land ownership within uh, the Crow Reservation is really non-native owned. So about 3% uh, of our Crow uh, membership uh, are actively engaged in, in ag, uh, whether that, and less than 1% of that's farming, uh, most of that's ranching. So land ownership ideologies were very different. Agricultural land use is sort of forced upon um, these, and it's sort of these forced relocations where land was held in trust by federal regulations um, kind of led to these massive land changes. Uh, land use is really gonna drive what vegetation change you see too. Um, and so ecological and vegetation changes, such as Russian olive, which was really brought in during the dirty 30s, um, purposely to plant um, as uh, you know wind breaks um, and to stabilize banks um, has really um, had a, a devastating impact along particular Little Bighorn River. If you drive on 90, you can certainly see a lot of Russian olive that were basically ubiquitous, particularly uh, troublesome in pasture lands, um, but also along uh, the river systems, so river and streams. So restricting cultural practices and native biota is really what caught where I was focusing my work. Um, so landscape ma or manage for really economic gain, really looking at productivity of land. Um, so these ecological changes sort of shifted in these land management ideals and sort of what happens is, you know, the social relationships sort of supplant one group's sort of landscape for another. Um, so, you know, uh, I think the, um, in, particularly in Hardin, uh, the ranchers there really have a very strong group uh, and sort of lobbied very heavily um, to uh, keep ownership within uh, non-Indian land use and management uh, or of ag uh, within the reservation. So again, I talked about um, most crop agri agriculture, uh, most livestock is done uh, what we do actually is very important to us along with our horse because we're a horse culture. But our elders were very concerned because they were uh, talking to me about fewer native woody species, these concerns about this Russian olive invasion, it's everywhere, and sort of reduced access uh, through land loss. So in my checkerboard ownership description, this is it. If you're looking at, you know, tribal trust versus um, fee patent or those that are non-native, non um, this is it. And this shows you the checkerboard ownership issue that we have to deal with and that makes for man land management within reservations troublesome. Particularly if you're talking about an invasive species um, because if you have one, you know, you have farmers who want to plant it, to stabilize their banks and you're trying to get rid of it because it's out competing your plains cottonwood and also leading to a reduction in our wild plums and our food sources like choke cherry, um, it becomes problemsome. Uh, so this is where we start to get in some of the policy issues. But 
first, let's talk about these culturally significant plants of concern. Um, where were Populus deltoides and willow, choke cherry and buffalo berry. These are all very significant and important to us. Um, we utilize these uh, plains cottonwoods also for shade structures during our annual crow fair. And there are certain size structures that are selected for both the Sundance practice of Sundance as well as utilizing in the right corner there a picture of our shade structures we use during you know our, our annual crow fair where we often use that to shade for cooking. So my chapter titles are here but what I focus on today is really American Indian land policy so looking at land use ownership status and the density of this Russian olive because what that tells us is you know where are the issues relative to land management? Um, and, and it's really going to highlight the fact that indigenous or uh, tribal nations should have, regardless of ownership, should have control over what happens ecologically on their land and with their water. So my questions were basic, just what's the density and are there differences really among land use types and land ownership classes? Um, and so, as you can see, Russian olive uh, mapped points, they are pretty ubiquitous. It was, it was pretty much, a, 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 you know, a, a lot of places along, particularly the Little Bighorn River. So my questions were pretty basic. Is it equally distributed? Um, are there differences in stem density? And this is the Western science aspect of it. Field sampling opportunities, presence uh, mapped, GIS utilizing geospatial layers from BIA. Um, obviously, to identify the uh, land ownership classifications, and then the interviews with our elders, um, which is really, um, you know, what I want to discuss uh, as I get through this particular part. So land use type, there really was uh, no surprises other than, you know, we all know that they are wetland, um, transportation and residential land use types, mixed rangeland that are uh, problematic. Um, but crop pastures are significantly issue, significant issues for us. Um, so here is the key, Russian olive stems within ownership classes. As you can see the fee patent, really that was, they were had the significant amount of, you know, stems or of Russian olives uh, within, you know, their uh, classification. Um, a lot of land was also an issue, but a lot of that lot of land is leased to non-Indigenous uh, non farmers. Um, so a tribal reserve and tribal trust had the least um, amount of, uh, of Russian olive stems, which shows you that some of the management techniques that BI was utilizing, and that's really um, you know, who came to me at first telling me about the problems with our divergent um, dams, um, and then you know, the problem with each time they go to do their dredging for these floodplain irrigation canals, up pops these great, awful uh, Russian olive stems. So, you know, I think it's important to talk about qualitatively. Uh, I, I was asked why I did quantitative, and I'll, I, I tell you, it's because federal agencies really want to look at the quali quantitative aspect of it. I wanted to bring in the voice, not just this number of people thought this, I wanted their actual voices. Um, and ask them, do you use it? If it's, you know, is it problematic? And, you know, without doubt, many of our elders just said, it, you know, it's everywhere, you know, our pastures full of it. Um, choke cherries and plums are gone, as you can see. And then I asked, you know, an important question, can you, do you find it more difficult now to find certain size cottonwoods for particular uses, um, you know, as opposed 25 years ago, as opposed to now, which was 10 years ago. And yes, basically um, the availability of these trees are becoming more difficult to find and harder to harvest or locate to harvest. So I did use some indices and you know, I had people ask me, why did you do that? Again, utilizing these um, really ethnobotanic and economic botany use indices sort of indicate and sort of point to, um, you know, what uses are, are being used for specific rituals and ceremonies, um, these use categories, and how significantly and important they are to each of these, um, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, sorry, our dogs came in, um, to each of our, um, uh, these uh, rituals and ceremonies. So I did also use um, our scientific names and our chronemes for the uses um, in order to gather a value, a, a use value. Um, but, you know, theoretically, you want to look at who, um, you know, age and gender theoretical knowledge. Um, we did some surveys through the community just so that we could figure out, you know, um, is there a disconnect from some of those who may or may not have connection to the land? Um, and is there, are there differences between age and gender? Um, certainly our elders and, and males knew much more about Russian olive and its problem and the issues behind cottonwoods. And it could be because they're the ones that actually um, do go out to collect for a particular Sundance. Um, but our, our women also utilize it um, as well for cooking. So, um, you know, you can see that there are significant differences in age groups. And so what that does is sort of indicate that we need to do more um, education for our youth about what these species are um, and, and also look at how we can manage as a tribe to um, mitigate uh, the impacts of the species and try to identify ways in which we can um, reduce that and increase um, buffer zone planting of cottonwoods and, and also bring back our, our choke cherry and uh, wild plums and buffalo berries. So not a lot we're able to really identify um, Russian olive and problematic um, uh, as you can see on the, on the right side from the survey responses. Um, again, just really our elders really knew because they, they know the history of that plant species coming here. And it also, unfortunately, looks very similar, um, you know, to our, our, our you know, uh, buffalo berry. So I had someone at first say, you're not trying to get rid of our buffalo berry, are you? No, it's a different, different tree and does different and horrible things. So, um, so basically my conclusions from this work really and, and why I really wanted to do this particular piece today um, is that, um, we want to talk about the threats to uh, our ability to um, practice our cultural uh, life ways to bring back food sovereignty um, and to maintain biodiversity and integrity along these important river systems uh, that we use and depend on for our life ways. So what has to happen is these policy changes have to be codified um, because when you're looking at dealing with the park service, with the BIA um, getting permitting, um, all of that to do any work uh, within the reservation boundaries is always going to depend on who owns the land. Um, and also remembering that um, many times uh, we have stories of, of people who have tried to, you know, get their own farm going um, and how problematic it was in order to get that done um, through all of the red tape, through you have to go through. BIA, when you have trust land, you can't go to the bank and get a loan for that because it's not yours essentially. Um, and there's a lot of wicked history I could go through on their trying to, through APRA, rectify an issue where you had 52 people owning it because you had uh, consistent generations passing on ownership of small parcels where you have 52 people having ownership and then not being able to make uh, adequate decisions on how they want to develop their land. So it, it's really problematic. Um, but um, I want to get into conversations with others here on, you know, I think someone made a comment um, on LinkedIn that says, it's all great to have these, you know, voices now finally coming to the forefront, but we need action. Uh, we have to take action. And, and I'm pretty um, adamant about saying that treaty tribes such as uh, Apsalika that we need to have say so over how our land is managed within reservation boundaries, regardless of who owns it, um, for obvious reasons, because of the example I gave on this Russian olive issue, um, where you know you have farmers that are non-native that are planting it and like it, um, difficult to get rid of when your neighbors plant it. So at any rate, I think I want to end it there and open it up 
to any questions or concerns that you might have about um, how this plays into a circular economy is that you know these uh, lands, if you're going to be able to utilize the lands to gather and harvest, obviously um, we have to have a plan and it, it has to be rectified through land policy tenure changes. Um, so at any rate, I, I hope gosh, I appreciate um, and I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll open it now to questions. Well, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Val. Uh, that was great. Uh, you know, I, I'm just going to make some comments here and just say that um, I'm so glad that you you talked about um, you know tribal land tenure and land tenure system because that's that's critical in understanding again how this uh, these new policy perspectives are going out from the White House. Um, I, don't, I want to get into that with you as well. Um, so please um, put your your questions in the Q and A box here. And, and Val, we have one question here already. It's from a Joanna Tang Tong. Can you talk more about how learning, teaching Western science and TEK differ? Can they be integrated together or are they completely different worldviews? Um, well, I guess I look at it as TEK is really what everything should come from. So what has happened often with research from Western scientists on reservations is that it's not driven by a particular need that will benefit the tribe. Um, you, you know, they just sort of come in, do this kind of uh, research and then leave with all of that data. And so one of the things that's really great to see is that through, you know, organizations like Native Nations um, Institute um, and others is that data sovereignty is becoming front and center now in Indian country and that we're, trying to make sure that we have um, people at the forefront to make sure that you know, any research that is done on the reservation um, is done so that it benefits the tribe um, and, and that you're not expropriating that information. But to answer that question, um, so I hope you understand that really TEK is the center. And from that, what I did was use the Western science to sort of say to Western scientists, look, I did these plots and it said exactly what my, the elders said, exactly. Um, and so um, I just sort of do that Western science side um, to show that um, although they may be different, they're both based on observations and really who better to know these significant changes um, that are happening in the land than the people that live there who have these oral histories that have been passed down um, from families, particularly, um, and clans. So, you know, I, I think um, from my perspective anyway, I think others may disagree, but um, I sort of want that to be uh, understood that it should emanate from, uh, from the tribe itself. So any research uh, or restoration efforts uh, within reservations um, all should be driven, designed, developed, and led by the tribe. And, you know, it's a great opportunity to bring community together, um, particularly bringing youth um, along with our elders so we can have that intergenerational transfer of knowledges and languages. Um, and so I, I'm, I think that might be a long answer, but I hope I answered <laughs> that question. I hope I answered that. But well, you're, I, I kind of have my, you know, particular <laughs> way of, <laughs> saying that I, I, you know, yeah, they, they're both based on observations, but, um, but there are differing worldviews. And I think being open to that from a Western science perspective is good and, and should be followed. All right. That's great. Uh, we have a question from Larry Dyer. He says, uh, could you expand a bit on what you mean by circular economy and how TEK can serve it? Question. And then he says, miigwech. Well, I think any of our knowledges really relate back to what may be culturally important to us in terms of foods. And I'm talking of food and ag relative to these circular economies so that we are growing our own foods. We are taking those food systems and making food products that can be sold off reservation. So we don't have people who have to leave because there's no economic opportunity. 
So what you're doing is you're trying to circulate what those food, um, you know, if we want to do choke cherry and pemmican and, you know, some of our traditional food sources, if we want to do those in jams and jellies, that we do that and be able to provide our own healthy food options um, within mm. our own communities that's grown within our communities so that you're not going off the reservation to purchase these foods, uh, to purchase these products. Instead, they're grown within the reservation from and, and driven by, you know, what is traditional and what is um, something that is valued and what's available that we already have out our backyards. I mean, Cedar Botel and I talked about that specifically that, you know, outside all of these, you know, herbs and all of these things that are growing, these fed us um, historically. And we can utilize those um, to product, you know, put those in a product and to feed our communities and to also uh, build products that we can sell offline. So I think being able to build up our agricultural um, economy as well, small farmers, you know, doing more gardening, um, getting our, you know, we have a great um, farmer's market that's been led by Plenty Doors um, on, on Crow that's run by Charlene Johnson. And, and um, so, yeah, I think, I hope that you understand that there's a circular way, but it's all driven by traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, we have another question from Joanna Tang. She says, uh, what research do you think would be helpful to get more pub publicity and advocacy for increasing codified tenure policies and food sovereignty? Um, that's a great question. Um, yeah, um, I think tribes, uh, I think are already doing that right now when, uh, you know, James brought up this group. I think there are a lot of our leaders out there that are trying to push um, action action-oriented codification. But um, what I think is key is making sure that um, you're not really conducting research for the purpose of needing to write a paper, um, um, but rather, you know, it's driven from a need within our community. And one of our needs is that um, we lack infrastructure um, for building out a lot of our food sovereignty programs. Um, and what I'm speaking about specifically, uh, my experience when I was with Trees, Water, and People is that there's no storage facilities available. Cold storage and dry storage is really important. If you're going to talk about building up, you know, you know, some of our uh, doing uh, the farming and the ranching and the gardening um, and providing that to our communities is that it's the best way to do that is to have these uh, infrastructure. So I think having ways in which you can help provide um, tribes with funding, I think is important. Um, and then letting them guide their needs and wants um, relative to those. But thank you, I appreciate that. And I know that we have a lot of good allies out there who wanna try to do what they can to help. Um, but you know, I think other than, contacting, you know, your local, I think everything starts local and I think contacting, starting with your local representatives, but also, you know, supporting and lifting other indigenous voices that are already out there, you know, trying to, you know, right. um, speak about these issues is really key. So. Well, thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a great answer, um, Valerie. Uh, we have another question here. It says, um, with the TEK related federal guidance that was put in place this week, do you see more opportunities for the kind of uh, uh, shared value discussions that EK incorporates into governance issues, discussions for federal lands? I do, and I think there is some changes that are happening within, but I think federal agencies are truly trying, uh, not all in all regions, but I think um, for the most part, particularly, you know, the Forest Service trying to um, work more closely and make sure that it's, um, it's not something after the fact that you bring the tribe to the table uh, for decisions that are made, uh, particularly on ancestral lands um, that are ten, you know, next to uh, like the Crow Res. So I, I do think they're opening up to that and being able, I, I think I can say I'm cautiously optimistic, but I think again, like I said before, is that 
you know, you have to have actions. You know, land acknowledgements are great. And I think everyone should really be acknowledging that you're on an indigenous lands and who's those lands historically belong to. But, you know, there's a responsibility that comes with that. It's not just words. So actions, I think, right. are important uh, right. to, you know, to um, carry out. What does that mean? Is that land back? Is that um, supporting and lifting indigenous voices in those communities who are trying to lift their own communities out of poverty and out of uh, not having available food systems. You're seeing now really what tribes have been suffering from all along, which is a lack of products, um, a lack of availability of healthy foods when the pandemic hit. So, mm -hmm. you know, welcome to our world, you know, 24 seven for how many years? Um, and it's great that we continue to be able to, you know, go and, and do our hunting. And, and we have, uh, many of us are getting buffalo back and our bison mm -hmm. to include that in our diets again. But, um, you know, it, it, it's a long haul and it's, it's um, appreciated to have people who recognize that um, you need to have the indigenous voices leading the way for um, actions, um, policies to be passed because otherwise you're just gonna get transferred to another um, you know, administration and they're just gonna really um, administratively, they're not gonna hand those down to those departments and, and ultimately it won't be, you know, nothing will happen. <laughs> It'll just go away. Right. Right. Well, you know, I, I'm gonna interject here and offer, offer a question to you, Val M. You know, you, know, you as, a, as, a, as a PhD um, scientist, from uh, from the Crow Nation, and I, I know of your work and sort of the challenges you faced, as you said, um, you know, studying science as a tribal person, a tribal woman. Um, you know, youth is one of our um, our focal areas here for the ESA uh, tech section. And how do we bring more tribal students into ESA or any kind of a organization um, like ESA? What would your be thoughts on some two or three things that we could do? Uh, strategically at ESA to make it more welcoming to uh, tribal students, in particular, tribal students from tribal colleges. Absolutely, yeah. I think tribal colleges need to be, um, you know, particularly because I used to work at Little Bighorn College and really um, they should also be leading the way um, because their students are there. Um, and, and really um, it's important that they have the opportunity to come to these types of meetings Mm -hmm. um, where their voices are starting to be represented, like through TEK. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's always the issue of it's, it costs money. Mm -hmm. You know, let's be real, it costs money to travel. Uh, most don't have these, kind, these kinds of funds for the high registration rates. So what you have to do is come up with funds to be able to help students get to these meetings and then give them something tangible to walk away with so that <clears throat> they may have you know, perhaps a project that they want to work on or some issue, and maybe they can get paired up with a mentor who uh, within the reservation can help them see that through, um, you know, get with their tribal college instructors um, that will help them see that through as well. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, we have another question here about, uh, uh, from Bob Newman, another question about scale. Can tribes accomplish what they want on lands currently under their control? or is it necessary to persuade others to manage uh, state federal lands differently, acknowledging that it is all indigenous land in truth? Well, absolutely, they do need to do that. Um, you know, whether that will be granted or not, but I think um, recognizing through the land acknowledgements what land you're on, and then those people need to be at the table um, during any discussions relative to land development. Um, or decisions made on land development, whether that's restoration or logging or um, any issues relative to um, changing uh, water levels, um, you know. And so um, I, I just think that, you know, it, it's always going to be problematic simply because of the land tenure, how it's set up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think how federal agencies haven't traditionally included those voices, but I think it's great that if you, um, as allies continue to raise those voices and bring them to the table, uh, that will be key. So um, anyway, I, okay. I'm 
sure I answered that very well. But, <laughs> well, yeah, we have a question from your friend, Grace Boltail. Hey, that's my name. Thank, <laughs> thank you for your presentation, Dr. Small. Uh -huh. did, they, did the issue of fractionated a lot T lands come up in your research? I wash your sheet, Grace. Uh, uh -huh. um, yes. <laughs> to, to, to put it simply, um, can you go back to the question, James? I think you took it off too quick. Um, yeah. Um, it says, uh, did the issue, did the issue of fractionated a lot T lands come up in your research? Absolutely. And the fractionated land is what I showed in the map earlier. And the issue was getting access to the data that mm. would allow me to determine, I have mapped this Russian olive tree at this spot, this GIS point, what land ownership class classification am I on? I obviously had to go through BIA. Um, and I also, I did get permission uh, from, you know, both working with Dr. Yarlett and uh, with the, at the tribal college. And I also got permission from, uh, uh, at then it was Carl Van, uh, our tribal chairman um, to do this. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it took a while to go through BIA in order to get those data. Mm. Um, you know, I didn't need to know who owned it specifically, what family owned it. I just need, is it fee patent? Is it tribal trust? Or, you know, is it uh, individual trust or allotted land? Mm. And so it was really difficult to get that. But I, I did manage, obviously, to, to be able to do that in order to answer what the density was of these invasive species, which kind of shows you how much they value uh, either, you know, a species. So obviously we don't want them. So we're, we don't have as many on our lands that we manage, but uh, our neighbors, you know, that are doing this, are planting these for bank stabilization um, have different opinions, <laughs> so. Right, right. Well, thank you for that question. Thank you for the answer, Abel. Um, you know, I, um, I have another question, you know, um, so I serve as the, ch the, ch the chairperson of the tech section and uh, we're getting ready for, um, in, in honor of Native American Heritage Month, we're, we're sponsoring a forum on November 30th at nine o'clock a.m. Mountain Time for about an hour and a half with the president of ESA, Dennis Ojima. And one of the questions that we're asking is, is how does ESA as an organization, how can it better support uh, tribal nations? That's the big, the big tribal nations, but within that, Obviously, our, our students, our uh, you know researchers, indigenous scholars, uh, indigenous organizations like tribal colleges, um, you know, if again, if you're welcome to be part of that forum as well. But what what would your thoughts be on organizations like ESA? You know, I mean, learning what we've learned, um, you know, how do we move into maybe a new era where um, yeah, where we're I'm more? Glad you brought that up. Yeah. Go ahead. Because you know, I, I was thinking about this earlier when you were talking about bringing students in and how to encourage and engage students to come to ESA. And I just have to say this, that um, you know, meetings are great, but they have to accomplish something. I mean, we can't continue to rehash the same things over and over. Um, what has to happen is we have to have some way to, you know, at the end of this, formulate a white paper to submit for um, policy considerations by the DOI, um, you know, policy considerations through the Forest Service, through the Park Service. Um, so there has to be, in my opinion, there has to be some outcome that there's an added action added and value added action to come from these meetings. Otherwise, you know, it's just kind of going over the same kinds of issues and, um, I think problem solving is very key uh, to helping other tribes or other students who are, uh, you know, trying to get through their PhD program is trying to help them by pairing them up with others who have been through, you know, uh, through that um, painful process um, and, and, and doing it that way. So I think, you know, trying to provide a, a support system for our students who um, are coming into this academic realm of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, primary or higher education, mm -hmm. um, but also making sure that these workshops are included that have some benefit in the outcome, that there's some learning come happen, some added act action is a result. So results 
have to happen in order, I think, to bring more people in. And you have to include more community elders. Mm. Some of our elders really, I think, uh, because of federal restrictions on who can get invited and paid for uh, to, to travel, unfortunately, you know, we have, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, on within our uh, community that are really, you know, started food sovereignty stuff a long time ago, like our Burdick Two Leggings. He was the one that started that uh, historically getting seeds from, you know, our uh, for, former uh, tribe with the MHA um, before we broke off from them. So getting these, you know, seeds that are, um, you know, ancient seeds and trying to continue to grow those. Um, you know, he did that many years ago. So there are a lot of community members that may not work for the tribe and and or, you know, don't currently work at BIA that really we should be including uh, to come and speak and share their um, their ideas about what can be done to help our communities move forward. Right. Well, that's a great answer. We well, appreciate that. Uh, I have a question from Stan Galloway. Stan says, uh, what is the preferred method of um, Russian olive eradication, herbicides, mechanical, et cetera? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think it depends, you know, um, early on during floodplain irrigation dredging, you know, it's just easy to go through and, and pull those, but they have pretty long roots. I think they're a facultative, um, you know, uh, species that uh, dig deep into uh, the water table. And so um, unfortunately, I think uh, mechanical is probably one of the ways in which you really are only successful at doing that. And, and, and or uh, what I was told by Dr. Tim McCleary at, at the Tribal College is uh, his management um, of those was to, on his land um, over at Tuligans was to basically to um, cut them, burn the stump, come back, cut and burn again. And then that was it. So. Um, you know, it really depends because you obviously don't want to use uh, herbicides uh, anywhere near water tables or water sources. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, to some extent, um, some of them uh, just have to be mechanically removed, which is expensive and hard and time consuming and costly. Right. Um, right. So I think now just making sure that we know where the gist of them are going to be spreading downstream, uh, no surprise. And, and coming up with a plan to plant what we want um, is important. And, and I think, um, thank you. Uh, I had a comment from uh, one of my uh, friends. Um, let's see, who was that that just brought up seed, seed remediation and seed saving is so key and critical. Thomas, was that you? It's Joseph Gazingwolf. Joseph, sorry, Joseph, was that you? <laughs> yeah. yeah he's all over the place he, he can't get rid of him he's all over the place he's just like a, he's like a real lakota you know he can't keep us keep, keep us boxed up he is my friend <laughs> and, and, and he's doing his work too and looking at the oh. issues relative to lent tenure and so um yeah seed seed sourcing and seed banks are also other issues that can play into um helping us to secure the plant species for our future generations and um you know that's pretty much um i think those areas uh getting a seed storage unit um, building seed banks and and building storage units for cold and um, mm. processing meats and cold and dry storage are key to building circular economies um, within reservations well, thank you val um, you know um Again, again, touching a little bit on the White House Tribal Nation Summit, climate change obviously was one of the big, big memorandums that was signed. I guess I would have a question for you, Val, is, you know, the, the National Climate Assessment, right? That big national report, a lot of time and energy and resources go into that. Yeah. Again, in your opinion, you know, what role do tribal nations, tribal students and tribal research play in that NCA? Uh, how important is it? Uh, does it really make a difference? And, and how does that you know, how does tribal leaders look at the NCA? You know, is it important to them or are there are better ways that we can assess and understand how tribes are preparing, but also take an action on climate? Are there better ways? I, I think um, I think they do a pretty good job so far, have been at least through the NCA4 
as a co-author, I know that mm -hmm. we try to reach out, but I think it would be great to, to bring in and provide economic opportunities for local community members to gather this information. I mean, again, we're always looking for how to build economies. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that might be one uh, suggestion, uh, in my opinion, is to make sure that you're getting com that community input that then gets filtered up to these NCA, you know, uh, national climate assessments mm -hmm. so that those voices are heard and captured and expressed within the writing for the indigenous peoples section, whether you're in the North Central or Northeast or wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, uh, uh, I know that's, that's starting to, to ramp up a bit. And I know I'm, I'm real curious to see how, you know, this week's uh, announcement about TEK and climate change and how how that's all going to come together. I know there's mm -hmm. an interagency task force that's, that's to be developed. It says that they're going to try to get input from tribal nations and tribal people. So how do you think that's going to be? I mean, based on your experience, you say you're cautiously optimistic, <laughs> but um, the, the, that interagency task force, are, do we have good examples of the, how that works well for, for tribal nations? Or are we still always, as you said, you know, disenfranchised or disempowered and, you know, really our, our voices don't don't really get heard. Well, I think it's that's I think we're I should be we should be encouraged because there are this is finally uh we have some people in the White House and also in agencies that are openly asking us to come in and talk and mm -hmm. bring our ideas um and to share through this interagency. Mm -hmm. Um what 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 I want to make sure is that and I think the National Congress of American Indian folks like and the president like Quan Sharp is doing is trying to make sure that these are actions that are policies that are that are able to be you know codified in and, and enacted upon because without it you don't have teeth it's just like on the reservation if you pass water quality codes if they're not codified through Congress it's very hard uh, to get teeth to put into that to save our water quality and, and improve water quality. And I'm sure Grace Boltel can tell you all about that um, water quality issues relative to management of water uh, within reservation boundaries where you have multiple agencies. Um, it's, it's very difficult, but I'm, op I'm cautiously optimistic. Well, so I think that's- we'll, a, see, we'll see what that, that brings to the table. <laughs> well, that's a good way to end our time today. Uh, Val, uh, cautiously optimistic about um, all the big news this week. And again, we'll in my yeah. in my lifetime, I've never seen so many people talk about TK. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's encouraging. Yeah. It's great, right. but and, let's and, let's make sure that that's not just talk. <laughs> okay, well, we Val, need you know, more than talk. Val, you lead the way on that. You, you sort of help us out on that for sure. Well, I just want to have everybody here in our community here at ESA Tech uh, thank uh, thank Val. Uh, maybe give her a, a virtual hand clap can they do that um can, but just uh, reach out to her i know she's available uh, she's available and uh she's she's a great great ally a great advocate and uh yeah please uh, feel free to contact me anytime james has got my um you know my contact information and there, there's a lot of miigwech here you see the miigwech i, I really have a yeah. hard time saying that because that's one of our traditional enemies at national so I'll, I'll say chi miigwech reluctantly yeah, <laughs> well, right, the great well, lakes you. folks really are good examples of how to work with federal agencies so we follow them all right well maybe we need to start learning to work together as tribes better absolutely, too. absolutely. <laughs> all right well let's um thank val thank you val yeah. again i'm going to close with this last slide please um all right Again, this, this webinar series is a 12-month 12, uh, 12 series, and we're really happy to have our, our next presenter will be uh, in December. Can I have that slide, please? Yeah, it's going to be uh, Ms. Paulette Blanchard. And so Paulette has agreed to talk about um, uh, Indigenous ethics, protocols, and research uh, in science, and we'll have her. And before we go, um, I want to, again, make sure that you're invited uh, to this um, Native American Heritage Month forum we're having with ESA leadership on November 30th at 9 a.m. And so it's on the website. I'm not sure if Bob can stick that in the chat right now, but uh, but please, um, if you have questions, you have ideas to how to advance and move ESA forward, where it could be more effective in working with tribal nations, we're happy to hear your voices. And so that's the platform. And so we're looking for an hour and a half of good discussion. Um, 
it will be recorded. Hopefully that it's uh, as Val said, you know, she's giving us a charge here. Um, let's take action on these good ideas and we got to do that together. So Absolutely. with that, I want to, yes, yeah, was with that, I want to close, uh, close our webinar today and say, thank you. Say, Wopila Tanki Chichi Apalo for your time and uh, everybody be safe and take care. Uh -huh. So we, we got that link going out. Um, I guess James just left um, on Twitter as well. And I saw Joseph had been posting it too. So um, anyway, we'll get that advertised. Thanks all. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bob. Yeah, and I've been, I've been advertising it at, yeah, on campus as well. So we'll hopefully get some, some good folks together. Yep, we'll just uh, make sure that we keep getting the word out. Yeah, people will be distracted by the holiday. So, right, put it in front of them again and again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. Right. I'll, I'll see you. I'll see you later today. Right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.